Hey everyone, thanks for uh, joining us for our uh, Thursday night devotional. I want to uh, remind you, yeah, tonight will be the last devotional in this way. And then uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock we'll be having our Good Friday worship service. So um, please make sure you tune in there on either Facebook Live or on YouTube. And we will remember in a deeper way uh, the death of our Savior Jesus Christ. And then we'll uh, gather together again on 10, at 10.30 on Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday. Um, please invite your friends. Um, there are three times out of the year, uh, three times in the life of a person who does not go to church that they are most inclined to go to church if someone invites them. One is Easter, two is Christmas, and three is during times of national crisis. Um, this is a huge opportunity. People are looking for hope. They're longing for hope. Uh, so I want to encourage you to invite your friends and um, attach your testimony to it, a, a sentence, a paragraph, and invite people to come and join us to hear the greatest news the world has ever heard. Um, so uh, that's what we have to look forward to for this weekend. Tonight I want to read from uh, Mark chapter 14, verses uh, 32 through 38. Mark 14, 32 through uh, 38. Okay, this is God's word. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Ava, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not watch, keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. This is God's word. One of the uh, great privileges in my life, one of my bucket list items I was able to accomplish last summer um, over uh, my sabbatical leave when Olivia and I got to go to the Holy Land. Uh, we got to go to Israel and it was um, a huge blessing. Uh, it was a great blessing. Uh, we were sent from you know, by our church and uh, was supported um, in, in many ways. Uh, thank you uh, for praying for us for that time. One of the things that I was asked when I was um, in the days leading up to the trip and, and when we got there, they said, hey, you know what, uh, DL, you're a pastor. Would you uh, be willing to perform some pastoral duties during this trip? And they said, if you would be willing to do that, we'll give you 20% off the cost of your trip. And I said, yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. For 20% off, I'll do whatever you ask of me to do. And so uh, some of the highlights were... Um, baptizing people in the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. It was an amazing moment uh, going on the Sea of Galilee and um, just seeing the places where Jesus did miracles, where he walked on water, um, leading uh, communion at the garden tomb where Protestants believe Jesus um, was buried and rose from the dead. Uh, just an amazing experience. And, and, and probably, I would say, one of, if not uh, the highlight of the trip was being able to share uh, from the Word of God as we're going to the Garden of Gethsemane with the 60 or so people on our tour group. Um, it was a blessing. Yeah, it was a blessing for me because whenever I, you know, whenever I would, would ask this question, does God love me? Like, how do I know God loves me? Uh, I would always be directed to the cross. Like, we always judge and measure the love of God by the cross and the power of God by his resurrection, the goodness of God by the cross and the resurrection, the wisdom of God. When we question it, when we doubt it, we always go back to those, those, those watershed moments in human history. But when it comes to... Uh, sometimes we need a fuller orbed picture of what's going on. That's why we study the prophets. We look at the different passages. We look at different angles of it. And one of the things that enhances my understanding of God's love at the cross is the night before in the passage we just read in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays for one last time, uh, so deeply anguished that he brings his disciples, leaves some of them 
brings three of them, Peter, James, and John, and then going further, he spends time to pray with God. And it says here, in verse 33, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Right? When it says, it says troubled, the word troubled doesn't even begin uh, to communicate the sorrow, the, the, the brokenness, the, the sense of, of gloom that is pervading Jesus' mind here, that's capturing his heart. It's, it's literally, he's, he says, I'm overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. It's like his heart is here and over his heart and under his heart and around his heart and within his heart, um, there's a sense of sorrow and pain and loss. It's the deepest kind of thing that no human being has ever experienced in their life. And Jesus, as he walks there on the night before he's to be crucified, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. So something is happening that maybe wasn't in the picture before that he begins to be deeply distressed and troubled. Stay here and keep watch. The casual reader would look at this and say, well, obviously, like he knows he's going to die, right? He's God. He knows he's going to die. Anyone on the, on, on the last night of their life is going to be deeply distressed and troubled and filled with sorrow to the point of death. But that's not what's going on here. I mean, when you think about it, Plato writes of Socrates that in the face of death, on his deathbed, Socrates laughed. Staring death in its eyes, he laughed at it. There are others who, uh, in the American prison system, if you're on death row, you have the dignity afforded to you of being able to ask for one last meal. And different people will ask for different things. So some of them will ask for something as, as, as uh, you know, simple as a slice of pepperoni pizza and a salad. Others will ask for a 52-ounce steak with Skittles on the side. You can ask for whatever you want, and the justice system is set up to preserve the dignity of every human being until the very end, even the worst criminals. But some of these people will order a $1,000 meal, a lobster meal, whatever it is, and when it arrives in front of them, they'll spit on it and will not take a bite as their way of defiance in the face of their pending death. Here it says, Jesus began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Is Jesus weaker than these heroes of old or these criminals in prisons on death row? Is Jesus weaker than that, that in the face of death, he crumbles in this way? Or is there something more? I submit to you that there's something more here. It says, going a little farther in verse 35, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Like what is it that causes Jesus, the Son of God, as he's walking, to fall to the ground? And the clue that we get is in the next verse. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus doesn't say, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow because of death. It says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. In other words, there's something that's coming to me that is so overwhelming that I'm going to die as a result of it. He doesn't say, in the face of death, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. What was it that drove him to sorrow to the point of death? It's the cup that Jesus says, would you let it pass from me? You see the intimacy with which he speaks with his father when he says, Abba, Father. It's like a, an Asian person saying Baba or Appa, calling out with the deepest level of intimacy, love, and trust, saying, this is who you are, my daddy. If it's possible, I know that your will may be different from mine, but here's what I'm asking. If it's possible that there be another way, let this cup pass. But at the end of the day, my face is resolutely set toward Jerusalem. Not my will, but yours be done. The mission must be accomplished, whatever way it looks. The question is, what is the cup all about? 
in Isaiah 51, 17 and Jeremiah 25. You look at the, the prophetic messages from 700 years before Jesus came and it says there's a cup filled with the wrath of God that the wicked will drink and judgment will come to them. It says this cup will cause men to stagger. In other words, the cup that Isaiah and Jeremiah talked about is the cup that Jesus has in mind that causes him to going a little farther fall to the ground. He's staggering because of the prospect of lifting this cup to his mouth. What's in the cup? It is the firestorm, the fury of God's wrath concentrated in six hours one Friday that Jesus would drink down to the very dregs until it becomes dry. What causes Jesus to be filled with such sorrow and anguish and to be overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death? It's knowing that when he drinks this cup of wrath, he will be separated from the Father from whom all he had known was the Abba Father intimacy that would be lost when he would drink the cup of God's wrath. It's every ounce of God's wrath against the sins of humanity. For every thought, act, word, speech, perpetrator of racist acts poured into that cup. Every prideful thought, tendency, action poured into that cup. Every indecent thought, act, lustful desire, greedy desire, covetous longing, whatever that might be, poured into that cup and the fiery fury of all of Mount St. Helens was concentrated in a coffee mug for Jesus to drink. And the kind of separation from God, his Father, that this, the drinking of this cup would entail caused Jesus to say, if there's any way possible, let it pass. But not my will, but yours be done. Turns out, there was no other way that at the cross, Jesus, who called out Abba Father even on the last night of his life, lost the intimacy with God and the words he spoke as he hung to die, drinking the cup of God's wrath, was my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If I ever doubted the love of God simply by looking at the cross, which I had looked at so many times, then opening up the doorway and sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane reminds me that Jesus loves me, that God loves me in a way that I could never imagine. I think about the garden. I think about what Jesus went through. I think about what he did for me. And I cannot doubt the love of God for his people. Jonathan Edwards asks, why did God, why did God even give Jesus the option? Why did he show Jesus the cup of wrath the night before? Why not show it to him while he's already nailed and secured to the cross? Why did he show Jesus the full cup of the wrath of God the night before? A full 12 hours before. Jonathan Edwards suggests it's so that we know that Jesus had a choice in this. That he willingly chose the cross knowing that it meant he would drink the cup of God's wrath completely dry. That when he cried, it is finished. Not only did he mean the debt is paid, not only did he mean that all that was required for the salvation of humanity was finished, but it could also be said that the cup of wrath had fully been taken, had been drunk, and it's finished. There's no more wrath for you and for me. That Jesus, having completely emptied out and dried that cup, now passes to you another cup, a cup that is full, not with wrath, but full of love. And that cup has refills constantly that whenever we drink of God's love and put that cup down, God fills it with more and more. And It's a cup of God's blessing. Jesus took the wrath that we deserved 
in order that we could have the blessing that he deserved. When you see the cup of God's wrath and the cup of God's blessing, we should have drank the cup of wrath. He should have drank the cup of ceaseless blessing. But when we weren't looking, as just as it was in the Princess Bride, he switched the cups on us so that he could take our punishment so that we could have his blessing. Jesus loves me. This I know. For Gethsemane tells me so. Let it be for you as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that nothing in the true story of redemption is an accident. Nothing is out of place. Nothing is incidental. But you showed your son the cup of wrath and he still chose it knowing what it meant for him, knowing that the, the mere thought of it caused him to stumble and to trip and to fall and to stagger. But for us and for our sake, he drank it dry so that the cup of blessing would never run dry for us. Thank you that this is the great exchange. It's the gospel, the good news. As we internalize it, as we drink deeply of its blessing, Father, fill us with wonder and gratitude all over again. May we never doubt your love. May we look to the cross. May we look to the garden. May we find our hope there. Thank you so much. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for uh, joining us. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock as we turn our affections uh, straight to the cross as we worship together for Good Friday service. We'll see you then.